Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I'm here with Zach Wilms and we're going to be talking about how to win bidding wars in a competitive market and then also how not to overpay when you're winning a bidding war. I'm so glad that Zach's here to share his knowledge with us. Before we get into it with Zach, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, let's get into it. Zach, so good to have you here, my friend. Uh, we've we've been working together for, for many years, um, traveling all over North America uh, with Keyspire, and I'm so glad that you're here to share your knowledge with my audience. Uh, before we get into it, tell everyone a little bit about you and what you do as a real estate investor and also as a realtor. Awesome, Darren. Well, I appreciate you having me on here. It's been a lovely time working together over the last little while, too. A lot of good memories we've shared, so... Um, just very briefly, kind of how I got started. I bought my first property back when I was 21 years old, um, had some money sitting in the bank account and figured real estate was a great vessel to get me to where I wanted to be. And quickly after buying that property, my parents and myself realized I knew nothing about real estate investing. So I decided to go get educated. And my mom actually sent me out to a Keyspire company that you have also worked for and spoke for. And very quickly after that, I realized that the property that I had bought was not the type of investment that I once thought it was. Ended up selling that property shortly after and getting into more of the multifamily space, buying the duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, and now going into some of the bigger burr projects. And throughout that journey, um, originally I went to school to be a paramedic and it was my realtor at the time that helped me buy the second property that looked at me and said, Zach, you love real estate. You're basically doing my job for me every day. She's like, why don't you think about getting your license? And kind of that light bulb went off my head like, you know what? That's actually not that bad of an idea. I do love what I'm doing here every day. I love real estate. I wake up thinking about it. I go to sleep thinking about it. So that's when I got my license about three years ago today. Um, been really heavily focused in the residential space over the last few years and now kind of switching gears into more of the multifamily space. But yeah, 2020 with the amount of bidding wars, like you mentioned, that were happening was a wild year to be a real estate agent. I'll tell you that much. So how is it that you um, position your clients? Because I know... You said, we talked a little bit off air, you were saying that about um, 90, probably 90% 90 of the properties that you sold this year represented the sellers went into multiple offers. So yeah. let's start there. Um, how, how is like, why is the market doing what it's doing right now in your opinion? Well, I'd say a lot of it really comes down to what everybody keeps saying, all the GTA buyers coming into Hamilton, right? Like COVID, as soon as that hit back in March, the real estate market was dead for about a month. And then right after that, Everybody in Toronto started getting out of their leases, realizing that they're going to be working home for an extended period of time and started rushing into Hamilton, like a floodgate just opened up. And it was at a weird point in time where people were still a little bit unsure if they wanted people coming into their house to do showings. So there was a lack of listings actually coming on the market because people didn't want people coming in their house. But there's this huge influx of people looking to move to Hamilton to get more space, be in more of a suburban area, not in a condo or something like that. So we just got a flood of buyers with a little bit of sellers. And then it probably took about two months until about the summer where everybody started realizing that they could get top dollar for their property. And then all of a sudden, all these sellers in Hamilton said, why don't we sell and cash out and go way out to the country? Because we're done with Hamilton. This is too much of a big city for us. We want to go out into the farmland. We want to get a couple of acres. And that's why all those farm properties ended up exploding kind of on the outskirts of Hamilton, even all the way out towards Dunville and things like that as well. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it's, it's almost simple economics, right? Supply and exactly. demand. Explain for people that don't understand the process, what is a bidding war and why, and how does it happen? So basically what, what happens is that the seller and the real estate agent that are going to be listing the property decide that there's so much demand for my property, given what's happening in the market, that we're actually going to list it typically about 10% below what the price they actually think they're going to be able to get for it is. And what that does is it broadcasts it to a lot more range of buyers that are kind of looking in those lower price ranges. Everybody kind of gets excited about it because they see it at a lower price thinking that they're going to be able to get a deal on it. And it just drums up all this competition, all this excitement about this property where all of a sudden next thing you know, you go into a showing and there's a lineup of people outside waiting to get into the property because everybody wants it, right? And then when there's not that much supply, you get one nice little property in downtown Hamilton under 400,000 that's on the market and that's it. So anybody shopping under 400000 is all seeing that one property and they're all going to be putting in an offer on it come a week from now. So kind of the timelines on what they do it is they'll list it usually on like a Monday or a Tuesday. 
and then they'll hold offers back until the next Monday or the next Tuesday following. So everybody basically has a week to go take a look at the property. You could bring a home inspector in that time as well too to get the property inspected. And you kind of have a week to get financing and everything figured out so that the next Monday you're kind of putting in your bid and hoping that you're going to be the one that's going to win the property. So what's the, what's the process on the back end like? Because I'm always curious. You, like You've been on, this, uh, on the side of it. Like, yeah. are you just sitting with your clients and looking at 10, 12, 20 offers? And, and how do you decipher from there which ones you kind of put in front of yourselves? Because you're not going to put 20 offers in front of them. How do no. you decide as the agent to say, here's the three or four that I think are the best? So a lot of it honestly happens within that week actually leading up to the bidding date because the good agents are calling you, asking you kind of all the little questions like ideal closing dates, when does your seller actually want to move, um, conditions, right? Some of them will actually bring the inspectors through. They ask about price. They're asking about all the little small stuff that actually makes a big difference on getting their offer up to the top three. But uh, usually on the final date, let's just say, for example, we've got 10 properties. There's typically about four or five of them that are going to be much better than the other five. And we usually look at those five and say, which ones are in the top three? And the top three, we give a call back to the agent, talk about the clients, right? Get a little bit of story from them, where they're coming from, what they want in terms of closing date, what they want sometimes in terms of inclusions with appliances and things like that. And really work with those top three agents to see if maybe they can do a little bit better to beat out the other three agents and just really present our clients with the top three offers. Because if we presented them all 10, kind of headaches that would be going on would just be insane for anybody to actually comprehend uh, a little off topic but what's the what's the craziest thing you've seen in an offer like in a bidding scenario is it like you know unreasonable conditions people just don't get it or like what's the what's kind of the the, the funniest thing you've seen in a, in a bidding situation uh, i'm gonna call a lot of the toronto agents in this situation because <laughs> <laughs> obviously not gonna say any names but you always get the Toronto agents coming to Hamilton and they give you the call and they're like, Zach, my clients love the property. Just tell me what it's going to take to get the offer accepted. And you're like, guys, that's not how it works. You put in your best offer. We pick the best offer. And they're like, nope, tell me the number. I want to know what it takes. Whatever it takes, we'll get this offer done. And that's literally what they're telling us because they're not looking at the market and they're not looking at the comparables to actually get an idea of value. So most of the time, they're just blindly throwing darts at the wall hoping that they're going to be the top offer, but they have no clue if it's going to be 50,000, 80,000, $120,000 over. So they're basically asking us, tell us the price to put down and that's what we'll give you. So- and, and so let's, let's kind of flip to the other side of that because that is uh, probably something that is on people's minds of, are they overpaying for properties? And you work with a lot of investors. You're an investor yourself. How is it that you're able to represent your clients on the other side of it when you're going into a, a bidding situation that they're not overpaying and that it still makes sense for them um, uh, to be a profitable transaction? Yeah, well, let's start with the investors first because I would say the investors are the ones that are a lot more particular with offer presentations and bidding wars and things like that because a lot less emotions are being played into this. Right? And they're thinking a lot more about the numbers. So what we basically do is just deconstruct the numbers backwards, right? And a lot of times the biggest bidding wars I would say get into these properties that have future potential, right? So there's something that you could do to buy, renovate, refinance, or there's something that there's some upside lift to the property. So now you have to kind of take that into factor as well and say, are we comfortable paying $100,000 over because we know with an extra $200,000 renovation that there's still an extra $100,000 left on the bone at the end of the day with obviously a little bit of buffer in there, right? So with investors, it's really just about deconstructing the property backwards and making sure that you can pay this price, do what you need to do and still have a buffer of what you're going to be able to make in terms of a profit, because that's the most important thing for investors, right? It's a lot less emotional. It's a lot more just numbers based. And if they lose something because somebody decides to pay $80,000, $90,000 over our price, because that's what the comparables say, and that's what it said you could still make a profit on, then it's no problem. We're just on to the next one and there'll always be more opportunities out there. But switching gears over to the first time buyers and kind of the people that are buying, I, I would say a lot more with emotions. That's where it gets more tricky because at the end of the day, the main conversation I have with them is that if you're not in this business to flip properties, then you're looking at like a five to seven year horizon. And you mentioned it with Hamilton being as hot of a market as it is. Last year alone, it was like 30% returns over the year you're pretty safe paying a little bit over what the last comparable sold for, right? So if we're looking at a couple of townhouses and the last townhouse sold for 475, you're pretty safe to say we could pay somewhere around 500, 510,000. And you're not going to say we're overpaying for that property as long as they're somewhat comparable. But when people are going in at a $475,000 as their last comparable and they're paying like 620, 
and things like that. And there's no rhyme or reason behind it. There's nothing you could do to the property. There's no renovations. That's when, unfortunately, you got to tell your client, somebody's willing to pay that price. You have to let them because they're going to be the ones that are going to lose in a couple of years. It's not going to be you, right? And that would be the worst case scenario for selling one of these places and having your clients lose in a couple of years. Which, which speaks a lot to your integrity as an agent, because I Huge. mean, you, you're a commissioned salesperson. So exactly. uh, selling a property at, uh, or getting your buyers to buy one at 620s and money in your pocket. But I think uh, you're a relationship builder, somebody who wants to have repeat business, somebody who was working in the business for, for many years and wants to work in the business for many years. So the yeah. good agents will talk their clients out of uh, situations, I would imagine. Absolutely. Yeah. As many ones as I won, I definitely talked to my clients out of a lot of other properties that just at the end of the day, weren't worth it. And reputation, relationships, everything like you just mentioned as well, is a huge factor in this business. And sure, you could push people to go pay way over what it's worth. But then when they come back to you in two and a half years and say, what is it worth now? What are you going to do? Tell them it's the same price you, you made them pay two and a half years ago. It's not something I want to do. What else are you doing? Um, because I'm sure there are situations where maybe you have equal numbers to somebody else coming in, in one of those situations. How do you get your clients, uh, in, you know, to, to be at the top of the list to uh, yeah. win that property for lack of better term? Honestly, I think a lot of it happens within that week span that you get from the time the property gets listed to the time that they actually take the bid. Um, doing things like pre-inspection so that you know all the kind of ins and outs of what's actually going on with the property obviously getting financing confirmed with a mortgage broker. And I would say always having a backup plan as well, right? Most mortgage brokers aren't going to tell you to go firm on a property, but it's good to know that if you do go firm, you do have a backup plan so that you're not going to be risk losing your deposit or anything like that on that end. Um, and then third and final, the most important is talking to the listing agents, having a good conversation with them, understanding exactly what their clients want. Like I mentioned kind of a little bit earlier, Closing date's a big one, right? Some investors, if you're buying an investment property, need to close on a certain date because of their financing. Um, some of them want you to assume tenants. All those little kind of things play into it. Um, having bigger deposits on the actual bidding date as well always helps in terms of confidence. Um, now, COVID kind of took this out a little bit, but presenting in person to the sellers, if you can, 100% is one of the best things that we always did um, to get our offers accepted. Being able to negotiate face-to-face and just even talk a little bit about your clients, talk about what they want to do, even in the investment world makes a huge, huge difference. Have you been seeing, um, this was something I was taught early on as an investor, like that, that personal touch to some offers mm -hmm. and things like that. Are you still seeing it? Like, I know we were kind of taught at one point, like, you know, submit a cover letter with your offer with a picture of you and your family and yeah. stuff. Have you seen that, you know, uh, being successful? I have seen it be successful, honestly. I've seen it be unsuccessful and I've seen it be successful. So it does depend on the client. So I would say, take the time, do it. Because if that's the difference between you getting the offer accepted or not accepted, it doesn't cost you anything extra, right? Mm -hmm. So I've definitely took pictures with clients with the sold sign in front of the house, um, wrote up nice letters, pictures, all that kind of stuff, just to try to give us that extra little edge. Sometimes it means nothing. If somebody's gonna pay $80,000 over the pipe person that put the letter in, Sometimes people are, are going to want the $80,000 instead, but if it's a difference of $1,000 or $2,000 and you're the one with the picture and the story and the other ones didn't, chances are you're probably going to get that profit. How is it that you come to the value? And I know probably you're just reverse engineering the numbers a little bit, but you know, how is, what does that process look like for you to walk through with your clients and say, here's what I think the accepted offer will be based on what this property is, is, is um, looking like? Yeah. You know what? It's not as easy as people think because a lot of it does come down to experience, right? You have to know kind of that neighborhood and what's driving those prices up. Obviously looking at the recent comparable sales of that neighborhood to kind of get an idea of what is sold. Um, but also looking at the property, seeing what type of renovations have they done? Is there future value add to this property or is there not? Is it kind of just a renovated nice property that's already been done that you're just buying turnkey? So there's a lot of different factors that go into it. First things first, I always take a nice broad look at the comparables, send it to my clients and say, here's kind of the ranges, the lows and the highs of properties that have sold. We take a look at the property. Once you have a physical look at the property, then you can kind of go back to the numbers and pinpoint more of those properties that are like, okay, this one and this one are very close to this property. If that one sold six months ago, obviously we're going to give it a little bit of boost now because the prop market continue to go up. So you're going to play into a little bit on that. Um, but a lot of it honestly does come down to that last day, the final couple hours, I always tell my clients it's a huge difference if you're competing with two offers or if you're competing with 25 offers, right? So a lot of times we'll kind of have a range going into that last day and then we'll start to see offers come in. 
And if there's only two or three offers, maybe we stay somewhere in the low end of that range. But if all of a sudden we're like 30, 40 offers, which is not uncommon in Hamilton anymore, then we're obviously going to the top end of the range and maybe even going a little bit higher than what we once thought. So a lot of it comes down to that. And you don't really understand that until that last like few hours before they take the offers. What's your perspective on this? I, I um, th- This is a frustrating process being uh, a buyer in, in, a, in a really hot real estate market. Are, do you believe that agents sometimes falsify numbers to get escalated prices? Yeah, so there's a, there's a difference between trying to get a bidding war and just being ridiculous, right? Like if a property, all agents and sellers talk about what the actual true market value is, right? So let's just use an example. Like if a property is worth 450000 me, you agree your property is worth 450. We could take an approach and say, why don't we list it at 399 because that's going to generate a little bit of interest, right? We're listing it below its market value. $50,000 should push this property up probably past 450, maybe to 475, maybe to 500,000 if we get somebody that's really interested. If the people that take the property at 450 and then go list that 349.9, which really drives the market insane because then you're picking up all these buyers around the 350 range that are getting all excited thinking I'm going to buy this beautiful looking property. And then turns out it's worth a hundred thousand dollars after that. And then an extra 50,000 because of the bidding war and they have absolutely no chance. And people get very frustrated about that because they end Mm. up seeing their dream house at the price that they're approved for, but then it doesn't sell for the price that they're approved for. And they just get completely crushed by that kind of stuff. So it really does come down to the agent and the seller, right? Like listing it, like I said, that 50,000 under is kind of a fair, type of thing to do for a bidding war, but doing like a hundred thousand under asking price just so that they can market it later on to their database and say, look at me, I sold this property for 150,000 over asking price means nothing because it probably sold like 25 or $50,000 over true market value compared to what they listed it for. What do you do on the seller side when you we're going to switch back to the seller side? Um, What do you do there to, to prepare your properties uh, for the buyers coming in? What is the, what is the best thing that your sellers can do? Uh, is it staging? Is it a home inspection? Uh, what are those things that you want to do to help the, the people coming in to potentially look at making an offer on your property? Yeah, it's obviously case by case, right? Like all properties are going to be a little bit different. Um, for instance, I'll just use your property as a perfect example. A property that's renovated, that's nice, that's kind of been flipped over. You do want to get staging on something like that because it's vacant. Nobody's living in there. You want to be able to show people that property in its best absolute light, Um, especially in 2020 with COVID. The one thing that really changed in the real estate marketing standpoint was getting 3D virtual tours, right? So the actual walkthrough tours before 2020, some people were using it. Most people weren't using it and just kind of doing pictures and videos. As soon as 2020 hit and a lot of people didn't want to leave their house as much, those virtual tours became absolutely essential. So people could actually do the full walkthrough of the property before even having to go see it. Because then instead of seeing eight properties, they're seeing like two properties. And it's the two that they truly, truly like because they've done all their looking online for it. Um, but I would say the biggest piece of advice I give to people is don't spend a lot of money. I know it sounds backwards, but the reason why I say that is because I've walked through thousands of properties with thousands of different buyers. Everybody's got a different preference on what they like in terms of colors, in terms of style. So if you go spend all this money redoing the floors or redoing your kitchen, there's a good chance majority of people coming in there won't like the finishes that you picked, right? And mm-hmm. I think that's why a lot of people that do flips just keep it very plain Jane, grays and whites, neutral colors. They're not trying to go and do anything crazy like that. And it's, it's the best way to do it. So don't spend a lot of money would be my number one type of advice for people. Yeah, no, it's great advice. Uh, Zach, uh, tell us a little bit about where you're headed now. I know you're switching gears a little bit, still working yep. as an agent, but uh, I wanted to just give you an opportunity to um, tell everyone what you're up to. Absolutely. Well, like I said at the start, I love real estate investing. That's truly where my passion has always lied. Um, so the last couple of years, I was working as a residential real estate agent, doing some investing on the side, like you said, working with investors. Um, but as of 2021, I switched gears and now I'm working in the multifamily sector. So dealing with apartment buildings, six units or bigger, and it is truly my passion. I could tell from the moment I stepped in the new brokerage that this is really what I love um, for myself as a real estate agent, but also myself as an investor. That's kind of the trajectory that I want to go in 2021. So about a month ago, we picked up an 11 unit building in Hamilton um, and that's the start of 2021. So it's going to be an exciting year. Um, very, very excited for the future, but the multifamily sector is growing, and I think a lot of the investors that I work with and a lot of investors that I talk to are all at the point now where they kind of want to scale up into see the bigger multifamily buildings. So 
that's really where I wanted to focus all my efforts as well. There's a lot of profits to be made in it. And there's a lot of ins and outs that people don't know about. So I'd be happy to be the expert in that type of field. Hey, Zach, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to well, join us. I think it's going to be hugely helpful for people to just understand the perspective of, you know, these competitive situations and how they can uh, truly still win in, in this, in this real estate market that we're seeing across the country. So thanks for taking time out of your day to, to walk us through that. Um, no if you guys enjoyed this session with Zach, go ahead and hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell and feel free to leave comments and questions both for Zach and myself. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenboros.com. With that, I'll say, Zach, thanks again for, for joining me. I wish you the best Thank of you. success on your new journey. And I look forward to connecting with you sometime again very soon. Thanks, Darren. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Thanks, man.